Welcome to First Sin Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, the author of uh, numerous novels and uh, nonfiction, all book-length work. I'm Molly Jo Riley, producer of the First in Fiction podcast and the upcoming uh, location mystery novel, NOLA. And a reminder to those, to those of you listening to the audio-only version, you can catch us live at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every other Tuesday right here on YouTube uh, or at AaronGansky.com where you can follow along in the chat room and say things to us, preferably nice things, but really, I mean, come on, you can say what you want to say. <laughs> it's a chat room, right? So uh, if you just uh, have some sort of a beef that you want to bring up with us, you could do it there, or you could say, hey, guys, nice job. Uh, Either way, we'll read your comments on the air, but only the nice ones. Now, uh, you can, if you are watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. And the best thing that you can do for us, aside from supporting us, because all of this is free, the best way to support us is just to tell your friends, your writer friends about us and uh, kind of spread the word. We're giving out some good content for free. That's kind of our mission. And we uh, just appreciate you helping us out with that. So uh, don't be afraid to share uh, all the links and all your social medias and all that wonderful stuff that Molly does that I'm afraid of. And uh, <laughs> that will help us out greatly. So as a matter of fact, those of you in the chat room, there are some links at the top there that you can just click and share the link with your uh, social media tribe. So there's that. Did I forget anything, Molly? Uh, subscribe to the monthly newsletter. Which you are doing a fantastic job with, uh, if you. I may say. We've had quite a few people subscribing lately. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber to our monthly newsletter, you may want to do that because we're actually doing something with it now. And by we, I mean Molly is really taking charge there and putting together some some good products. Uh, yes. Just sent one out today, correct? Yeah. The yeah, there was one that went out, out. Uh, actually went out at midnight last night and uh, I worked on it until about 11.56 last night. So I was oh, awake when, it, when I got the MailChimp that said it's been sent. So hooray for that. So there is a subscribe button on the bottom of AaronGansky.com slash First in Fiction Live. So we don't have the subscribe link on the YouTube feed for the replays, but we do have it on his website. So go to AaronGansky.com, click on the First in Fiction Live button, and at the bottom under the chat, there's the subscribe box. Thank you for that. So yeah. I'm pretty excited about that. That's a good place. The newsletter is a great place to kind of keep up with us personally, what we're up to uh, on different projects or what we're reading or uh, whatever little tidbits of advice that we have. Uh, it's a good way for uh, you guys to connect with us as well. So I uh, would love to have you guys subscribe to that now. We do turn our attention up. I'm wondering if we're going to have kind of a longer night tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll try and wrap everything up in the hour, but we've got a lot to cover tonight. Continuing our series of gross anatomy of a novel, uh, turning our attention this week to setting and detail. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. It's usually one of the first things that I discuss with my new writer uh, students because it is the thing I think that is hardest to master and easiest to neglect. And I would say that most new writers tend to struggle in this area more than in any other area. So we'll talk a little bit about show don't tell today, but um, really what we wanna drill in on is this idea of setting and how you establish the setting using detail, specific imagery. So uh, to begin, let's define what we mean by setting. So setting, uh, most of you know, refers to the time and place in which a story takes place. So it cannot be established without using detail and imagery. That is language that appeals specifically to one of our five senses. So you'll hear us talk about that quite a bit. There are two elements of setting that you must have. The first is place. Uh, and this is the one that we most often think of when we consider setting. It's perhaps the most important aspect. Um, and it is often thought improperly as the only aspect of setting. Uh, but you'll see there's another detail a little bit later. Uh, so the place is simply the location uh, of your story, where it takes place. And the rule here is that it must be specific. I'm going to relay a, a little bit of a personal story here. I, I wrote a short story while I was in college, turned it into uh, Brett Anthony Johnson, who was my teacher at the time, uh, my professor. and his question to the class was at the end, after everybody had workshopped my story, his question was, where does this take place? 
and nobody was able to say. And so his question to me was, where does this take place? And I said, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just meant to be any town. And he said, well, the problem is when you try and make something work in any town, it doesn't work in any town. There is no town. Um, you want to be specific. He said a love story in New York is not a love story in the deep South is not a love story in England. If you've been listening to the podcast much at all, you've probably heard me say that it's one of my quotes that I like to hang my proverbial hat on. Um, and so when you are writing, you must have a specific place in mind. Now, if you're doing an actual place, you want to do some research. Uh, you want to find some photos, visit the location. If you have an opportunity, um, go out there, uh, talk with people who live there. Uh, Molly, you did a lot of research on New Orleans mm -hmm. for your, your novel, NOLA. Um, do you want to just kind of share some of the things that you were looking at when you're researching all that? Yeah, I, I look at not only just the setting, but the culture. I reached out to uh, the New, Visit New Orleans online, which is their tourism bureau. I actually connected with a friend who lives down there. So I was getting ideas as to, uh, I, I use Google Maps and, and Google Earth as well, so I could get a visual for it. I wanted not just the setting of the location, but I also wanted the culture, the atmosphere. What kind of food do they like? What's special to that particular era? There's there it it really was like taking it as a character and filling it out with all different aspects of that character. What is unique to New Orleans? The culture, the music, the people, how do they respond? How do they talk? It was building the city as a character. I like that you say that the setting as a character. And when we think of place and time, which is the second element, um, it really does become uh, a character in the story, or at least it can and should. Um, so and if you're writing about a real place, do some some research. I've read books that are supposed to take place in particular cities, and I, I haven't been able to recognize the cities at all. Um, there is no real appeal to any particular landmarks or the way people speak or the culture of that particular area or anything like that. So, um, you want to make sure that it's authentic and real. Does that make sense? Yes. So, uh, now what if you're writing about a fictional place? You're not going to be doing research, but you are still going to have to ask yourself the difficult questions. You're still going to do what we call world building. And we've got an entire podcast on what world building is and how to do it uh, in our archives. So we'll have to maybe dig that up for you for one of our From the Vault series coming up. Um, otherwise, you can just search for it on our YouTube channel and you'll, you'll, it'll, it should pop up or on aaronganski.com. Uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to think of unique land formations. Uh, interesting wildlife. You're going to give names to different plants. How is your world different than ours? Um, think of proper nouns. The more specific you are, the more realistic, the more um, immersive the setting becomes. Does that make sense, Pops? Yeah, it uh, it does. And uh, perhaps I ought to say that when we're talking about settings, it doesn't necessarily have to be a city. There are scenes within uh, the book, they're going to have their own setting, and uh, you need to have proper detail for those, too. Um, once they're in introduced, you don't have to go into too much detail next time they're mentioned, just anything that's different. Uh, but even uh, fictional places like Springfield, you know, the home of the Simpsons, have landmarks, uh, and you see it in the opening credits. Uh, you know, there's a particular statue. There's a, a forever burning pile of tires. There's the uh, uh, nuclear power plant, all those things. And so those who watch The Simpsons will recognize all of those spots. And so it means something to them. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, when doing fictional places like that, we want to keep that in mind. Uh, but you can create entire worlds. We go back to a book we've talked about a lot, a Rendezvous with Rama. Mm -hmm. The whole setting is on this gigantic spaceship that is uh, uh, going to be passing uh, by Earth. And it's it's got an entire uh, ecosystem inside of it. Uh, and very detailed, uh, but very foreign to the reader. So all that had to be properly described. And fortunately, Arthur C. Clarke uh, doesn't mind taking a lot of time to describe stuff. Yeah, but you got a very uh, clear vision of it, as well as some of the science that made it possible. And on that note, uh, you did a ton of research 
for your J.D. Stanton series, well, really for, for most of the books that you write, <coughs> um, but I'm thinking specifically the J.D. Stanton series, um, A Ship Possessed, uh, Out of Time, those types of things where you have a, a Navy captain on uh, particular Navy ships of a particular era um, that are so well described that some of the people who served on those ships sent you letters, is that right? Yeah, that's true. I did a lot of research on World War II submarines, um, uh, Gatto and Baleo class uh, submarines, because a lot of the scenes took place either on uh, the deck of the submarine, and the old World War II submarines had a deck. Uh, they're not the we're not the real rounded ones we get with nuclear subs. So a lot of it took place on the deck and then uh, below deck, and uh, so I had to know what those things looked like. So I toured. Uh, World War II subs. I did as much research as I could with books uh, on the internet, photos, but the thing that helped me the most was uh, I think I toured uh, two or three different uh, uh, World War II submarines that had been turned into museums. So I could go through and I could see where people slept, how much room there was. Uh, I even uh, toured a, a Russian submarine one time. And uh, boy, that was tough duty because those things are horrible inside. Um, mm. It's, uh, it's amazing that uh, they didn't get killed by the, the stuff they had mounted to the walls. Uh, but it's a very unique environment. But even then, and this brings up something about setting, uh, uh, a submarine is divided into areas. There's officer country, and that's where people with college degrees and where officers in the submarine would do their work and uh, where their sleeping quarters were. And you work your way back through the submarine, and the education level goes down. So if you're the very uh, uh, the stern end, the very back in the machine room, uh, the engine room, you're probably an individual that doesn't have a lot of education. Uh, and so the way they talk is different there than the way they talk at the front of the boat. So it uh, yeah, did that with, with submarines and uh, with uh, other places too. Mm. Absolutely. Which brings up like an interesting thing. The, the second thing that we want to talk about is the time period that your story takes place. And so Pops, the, the, the submarines that you looked at were World War II era. And so you had to get the dates right, which submarines would actually be around and in service at this time, those types of things. Um, you know, a, a love story in New York in 2018 is not a love story in New York in 1918. Um, and so you want to consider that as well. Uh, it's going to have a pretty profound impact on your story, whether it's in medieval England, um, where you have castles and knights, or a love story set in the Deep South in the 1920s or during the 60s, um, those types of things. It's it's going to be different. It's going to have a profound impact on your story. So how, how does it have an impact on your story? Usually in terms of conflict. Um, this kind of brings up this idea of circumstances. The World War II, those are the circumstances. It's a time period and it's a circumstance. It doesn't matter where your story takes place during World War II, the world was at war. And so it would be really ridiculous to set up something during you know 1940s America where nobody talks about the war. That wouldn't make any sort of sense. Um, so keep in mind what types of circumstances are going on in the location that your story takes place at that particular time. And again, this could be fictional. It could be, you know, uh, Middle Earth during the reign of, you know, King whatever. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not up on my Lord of the Rings. I apologize. Um, you know, before Sauron uh, took over the first time or, or whatever it is. These are the types of circumstances that are play into your story. So you want to establish the time period Again, by using specific detail. You're going to hear me say that a lot tonight. Uh, how do you do that? This can be seen in fashion. Think of anything that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote. Um, he took a lot of time describing people of particular fashion sense and what they were wearing. And um, you could tell a lot about a character based on what they were wearing, how much money they had, those types of things, what they valued, uh, how much industrial development there is. Um, you want to do some research to make sure you're being accurate. Again, if you're doing any sort of historical novel, um, you gotta, you've got to you got to get the details right because if you don't, you are for sure going to hear about it. And if you don't get the details right, more often than not, it's going to cost you a, an opportunity at a contract. Um, if you're writing about 1920s America and you know the notorious gangster Bubba McBigfoot, uh, <laughs> You know him. Uh, oh, he was a bad guy. Oh, yeah. he was bad. 
Yeah, you know, if he pulls out his I, cell phone to make a call, um, we've I'm got a problem. I'm seriously laughing. I'm sorry. I think if you name somebody Bubba Bigfoot, we have a problem already. Uh, no, it was Bubba Mick, but Bigfoot. Oh, my mistake. Then that Scottish. just changes everything. It's a tiny Scottish. Bigfoot. Yes, <laughs> it's the uh, it's the Scottish Mafia. Okay, um, you know <laughs> where they meet and eat haggis, where they discuss who's going to get uh, who's going to get strung Look, just up. Carry Keith on. And, I don't know. All right, moving on. So, uh, does that make sense, there, pops? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but not to mention haggis. Uh, if, if you're going <laughs> to Insert that in the story. You need to know what haggis is and why no human being should ever eat it. Hmm. Right. But nonetheless, it's a delicacy there. But that's the kind of details that will trip people up. Uh, I remember Jack Cavanaugh telling me one time that uh, he got in trouble. He did a lot of historical work. And one of his uh, biggest curses was making sure uh, if in the time era that he was writing, whether or not people tied their shoes or, or buttoned their shoes. And in, in one, uh, he had mentioned that they had tied a shoe and that wouldn't come around for another 10 years or so. Uh, he was still in the era of shoes that were buttoned. Uh, so he had to keep track of that. Uh, and it's it can really throw you off. I don't know if you've ever seen an old Western where they weren't real uh, consistent about um, continuity. And you'll have the uh, good guys, the sheriffs and the posse chasing down the bad guys. And in the background, you can see high power uh, lines. Uh, running across yeah. the, the yeah. landscape, you know, maybe a freeway. Uh, every once in a while, those would sneak in there. And you're thinking, nah, somebody has uh, missed something in all of this. And it knocks the people out of the story. That's why it's important. So and when you talk about time, you're, uh, you're, you're teaching a good thing here because you do have to keep that in time. Now, with uh, like the great Gatsby, which, Gap, Gatsby, uh, which you were mentioning earlier, um, uh, he lived during that time, the author. So, you know, he was writing contemporary stuff, as was Thomas Wolfe and the like. So true. Um, so th they didn't have much problem with keeping the time correct. But if I were to write about it, the 1920s, I've done a lot of research in the 1920s, I would have trouble. Yeah, I would go back and get books written in the 1920s about the 1920s and see what they say. And the uh, catalogs and stuff like that, if you can get them. Some of you can get them online. Yeah. Hmm. So what do you do, Pops, when you're trying to establish a setting, be it fictional or, or non-fictional? you have any tips or tricks? Well, I've done, uh, I've done several things. Um, you know, uh, first, let me say this. Some people keep a notebook on this. That's really a good thing to do is write down these details. So if you have them buttoning shoes and you need to maybe make a note of that. Um, but if you're in setting, if you're talking about certain streets and you change the name of the street, you need to write that down. Uh, so you don't get confused. And I used to collect pictures of floor plans, things like that, uh, to jog my memory uh, when I had to describe a setting, let's say in a large house, a mansion, and then we're going to be in one of the bedrooms. What does the bedroom look like? And having photos of that helped me. So if they were, if it wasn't a place I could go and take photos, then uh, sometimes you'll find this stuff online or in magazines. <coughs> Excuse me here. <clears throat> uh, but I've done several fictional towns. And I find it's very helpful to start with a real place. So some of the fictional towns that I've created are really based on uh, actual uh, small towns. Ridgeline, uh, in my Ridgeline Mysteries, uh, Suspense Mysteries, is a California mountain town. I based the physical description mostly on Arrowhead, California. But if I wanted to add a, a certain street, if I needed some other landmark there, I could put it there. It didn't really matter. I just had to make sure that I made note of it. But that's based on a, an actual uh, city, Arrowhead, California. I did the same thing in my Maddie Glenn Suspense Mysteries uh, in Santa Rita, California. Santa Rita, California is really Ventura. Uh, all the street, the directions they run, the hillside, all of that is uh, Ventura, California. And then I threw in a little Santa Barbara here and there to uh, kind of spice things up. But uh, you could take some of the street names, um, and, and use them when you went to Ventura. In other cases, I would change the name to something similar, but I uh, did that. And here's why it allows you to use maps. Molly mentioned maps. Um, mm -hmm. Maps are great for writing. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in taking a real city and you can change the names, just write it on your map. Uh, or if you're using an online um, thing, and uh, I'm gonna suggest that you do that, use Google Maps. And when you do, there's a little yellow man that will appear 
and mm -hmm. if you drag the little yellow man over to a street, it will put you in street view. It is as though you're standing on the street and you can spin 360 degrees and see all the buildings that are there. A uh, good number of yeah. years ago, I did a, a screencast on using Google. And when I talked about uh, Google Earth and using Google Maps to look at those things, uh, I use as an example uh, one of my books uh, for wounds, uh, the book Wounds, where I wanted some of the crimes to take place, and where the detectives were going to be and stuff like that. And I could, from uh, my computer, go to that place in San Diego, see the kind of trees, what the uh, park benches look like, how far the ocean was, how did the sidewalks run around this particular uh, Oceanside, Bayside Park. I could see all of those things. Uh, you could take screenshots from them. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, print them out and make notes. It's uh, incredibly powerful, very useful, and it'll also keep you on track. So use Google Maps, learn to use it well, and it will be a, a big time saver for you. It's a great tool. It's yeah. a great resource. I did that uh, when I, in, in writing Who is Harrison Sawyer, um, and I had them moving through the, the country. They were on the run. And so I had to find you know, particular places in particular cities and what did it look like and how are they getting in and out of the building and those types of things. Um, I did it uh, a little bit with uh, some other books as well. So it's a pretty common thing for me to do. It's very useful. Um, and we can't always get out and visit the places that we're going to write about. And so it makes more sense to mm -hmm. be able to, to do that. Um, I've also done fictional towns as well. Um, I've had my students draw maps of their fictional towns just to try and keep everything straight. Um, giving, you know, having them name particular places. Uh, you'll you'll hear me talk about that later, but the specific nouns and the proper <coughs> nouns go a very long way for establishing a setting. So um, how do we do this? Well, I like to think of um, setting in, in context of if I'm a playwright, if I'm going to be writing a play, I've got to be able to talk with the producer and the director and, and figure out what props we're going to have, right? Uh, what costuming choices are we going to make? Remember, though, that there is a cost to every prop. What that means is you don't want to go on for, for 22 pages describing uh, a setting. That's going to be too much. There are a few exceptions. Uh, maybe if you're writing a mystery novel and the, you're describing the crime scene, you're going to take a lot of time doing that. Your detective is going to go through and pay attention to a lot of the details. If you are writing, let's say, uh, was it Rendezvous with Rama, where you've got to explain a lot of science and how this thing actually works, um, it's going to take more time to really describe that so that the reader, who is probably not well versed in astrophysics, um, can figure out why the characters are doing what they're doing. Uh, so think about that. What props are important? Do you put a vase on the table? Well, probably only if it's going to fall off and break or if somebody's going to smash it over somebody's head. Um, these types of things. Otherwise, you can just simply say there were flowers in the apartment. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, what, what does this town look like? What are the, the building, the architecture? Um, what does the backdrop look like for the, the artist who's going to paint that? Um, if, you're, if you want it on the stage... You've got to put it in there. You've got to use that detail. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. Uh, if you spend too much time describing something, then the reader will assume it's going to be uh, important. It's part of the establishing shot. Uh, you know, when you watch uh, mysteries on television or suspense, you'll see a gun hidden in a drawer. Every time you see that, you know that gun's going to play a role. Uh, otherwise, there's no sense in showing it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you do have some freedom to set up what a house looks like, um, you know, what the dining room looks like, what maybe is on the table of the dining room, uh, but make sure that it says something, that it furthers the story. So you can populate things with items as well as with people, and you can populate some of those scenes, uh, but only give uh, any kind of uh, a special attention to something that's going to play a role later. Don't do it too much because then you're telegraphing. Just make sure that it's clear at the, at the point of first mention. Basic rule of thumb is the more time you spend describing something, the more important it becomes to the reader. Yes. Um, and if they get to the end of the book and you've spent 22 pages describing a vase on the table and nothing ever happens with that vase, they feel that you've wasted their time. Um, and that's not where you want to be. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule, but um, that's, you know, 
very, very few exceptions to the rules. Speaking of rules, um, I've got some rules for setting. I know you're wondering, when is Aaron going to give us his rules for setting? Well, now is the time. Now, again, whenever we talk about rules, we're going to put rules in quotation marks here. Um, rules are meant to be broken. There's always exceptions to the rules, blah, blah, blah. But these are pretty good rules of thumb or guidelines, if you prefer that term, uh, for establishing the setting in your story. Uh, the first thing that I, I say is that all stories must take place in a specific time and a specific place, both of which must be relevant to the characters and the progression of the prose. It's not in the show notes, but I keep coming back to this idea. You've heard the expression, I imagine, you can take the cowboy out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the cowboy. You guys heard that expression? No, never. I no, never uh-uh. What are you talking no. about? Feels like that sarcasm. Up, that feels <laughs> like our, our radar is going off right now. Uh, accurate, accurate radar. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that, that really speaks to the point. Your characters are products of their environment. They are, they take on characteristics of their environment. What's uh, socially acceptable in some parts of the country are not socially acceptable in other parts of the country. So keep that in mind. How has the setting shaped your character, not just the place, but also the time. Um, setting, another rule, rule number two here, setting must be rendered with as much specific relevant detail as necessary, which might vary from, from scene to scene. Uh, proper nouns help set the scene and create familiarity or strangeness. Um, please don't talk about the hardware store. Instead, talk about, you know, um, Bob's famous hardware or something like that. It makes it feels a little more hometowny. As a matter of fact, our hardware store where I live, if I walked in uh, tomorrow morning, there would be fresh baked muffins on the counter. Like it, it's it's not Mary Mayberry, but it it's Mayberry it's where I live. So pretty close to Mary yes. Mayberry, yeah. And and they offer you a a fresh baked muffin while their Irish setter is you know <laughs> uh, welcoming you to the store and rubbing up against your leg. So it's it's very much Mayberry, and it's it's. It's unique. It's a unique place in California. Not, you know, the people. Man, here I'd be are, going to the hardware shop a lot. Yeah, you would. <laughs> right. Yeah, you would. I just the the rest of the hardware intimidates me, but I like the the muffins and the the dog. So, mm -hmm. uh, weather is different in different parts of the world and should be felt and experienced. I always think it's weird to go through an entire novel and there's never any mention of weather other than it was raining or the sun was shining. Um, we experience weather. I mean, I'm, I don't want to say I'm obsessed with the weather, but I'm constantly checking the weather because I want to know if it's cool enough to open my windows because I'm dying and I need some air. Um, so we, we have weather. It's hot in the desert. It's dry in the desert. It's no fun in the desert. Um, but, you know, out in North Carolina, it's a little bit cooler. It's more humid. That's for sure. Um, but they also have plants. And I like that. I don't get a lot of that in the wait, desert. Wait, wait, they have what? Plants and grass. Uh, I had to do some research to figure out what the green stuff on the ground was. I thought it was some sort of mutant dirt, but- That's, uh, that's the mold, right? That grows in strips? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is, so. Okay, um, just but checking. Don't, don't neglect the weather. The reader, if you're writing about Antarctica, the reader should feel cold, and they should feel cold throughout the entire novel. Um, unless there's a warm fire and then you can let them be warm a little bit. But, uh, but can, I want to interrupt here on this because yes, you need to pay attention to the weather, but you can overdo it. In my first draft of NOLA, how many times did you and Alicia tell me, stop saying how humid it is? Because my character, every page was, wow, it's warm. Wow, it's humid and varying degrees of wetness and dampness in the air. Um, you can leave reminders so establish it establish it early and then just leave reminders you don't have to you know remind them every single page but somewhere in the scene maybe remind them with just a quick line somewhere um can you overdo it you absolutely can and i would say most writers who are you know i would rather have a, a new writer over write and over emphasize setting than to not emphasize it at all, if that makes sense. Because it's easy, What really what you're doing as a writer, when you're describing something and you go on for 
at great length describing it. What you're doing is looking for the right description. The best writers are gonna go back through, find the right description and get rid of everything else. But sometimes we don't get it right away. So we have to practice. And so when you've got a, a, a scene that is really establishing it, just go back and trim it up a little bit. Keep the one or two best descriptions and then move on. Does that make sense? Yes. And you know, Dean Koontz is great with uh, weather, especially with rain. Um, and some of the, in this middle part of his career, some of his descriptions are just fabulous. Um, one I remember is he's talking about a heavy rain and it silvered the road. Mm. Ooh. The word silver, yeah, he, he verbified it. It silvered the road. And I thought, man, that's one of the best descriptions because I could see the, the glistening of the water mm -hmm. on the asphalt. Uh, and so he he's done that with several of his stories where weather plays an important role, uh, is book lightning. Um, this, and so he makes really, he makes that kind of environment, uh, the weather, the climate, uh, a character. Uh, Odd Thomas does that because they're in a desert community. And, uh, and you really get a sense, a feel for the desert, kind of feel dirty at times. Um, and the, the blowing wind and stuff that the, the two really have to put up with now, um, <laughs> that it's, I put up with for so many years. Um, what's, what's the line? There's two days a year when the wind doesn't blow and this isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's, it, it's constant when you live with it, you know, you just live with it. But uh, if you're new to the area, well, you put that on a book and it really gives the uh, area some, some character of its own. So the weather can set tone, can set emotion, it can build tension. Uh, it can ease tension, can be representative, symbolic, metaphoric. You you bring up a good point. <clears throat> and our description of setting is going to come from the point of view of our character. And mm -hmm. so it will be not always metaphorical, but it will reflect how the character feels about the setting. If they love the snow and they're ready to go skiing and drink some hot cocoa, they're going to describe the snow in one way. However, if they hate the snow and they're you know, they don't have a warm jacket and they're just caught out there. Um, the snow is going to be described differently. It's going to be more menacing. Um, and so consider that you're describing the setting from the point of view of your character. And you, it's funny you mentioned Dean Koontz because when I read that, I just felt right at home. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's about it. So uh, another rule here, setting is always experienced with at least three of the five senses and sometimes all five. This is where you really want to think mm -hmm. of show, don't tell. Again, this is my quotation marks rule. Um, do I always follow it? I try to. Not all at the same time. You don't need to throw pack all this into one page. Uh, but as you go throughout your story, throughout your scene, drop in a detail here or there. A quick reminder of the five senses. I think of it as the three S's and two T's, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Uh, sight is the easiest, it's probably the most commonly used uh, imagery form of it, form of imagery. Um, but what you really want to think about is not the blue sky, because this might shock some of you. The sky is blue everywhere. So please don't talk to me about the blue sky. It's, it's, I've seen, it. I know it. I, that's, let's get to something different and unique. That's really what you want to focus on. What's unique about this setting? What sets it apart? Um, the sunset behind the river, igniting orange diamonds on the surface of the rippling water, you know, something like that. Um, and even in that, that's just a quick thing that I came up with. Uh, it says the river. My rule is use specific nouns. I would want to name the river. The sunset behind the Yaganoga River. I don't know what that yeah, is, but, right. you know, um, and that's going to make it a lot more interesting. Uh, so there's some, you know, some, there's a, metaphor in here and i'm trying to describe kind of a beautiful relaxing type of a setting uh sound this is the second well, before most we jump to sound let me throw something in there um you're describing some very good stuff and i remember uh trying to describe the setting sun uh and i described it as uh as, talking about the sun descending towards the horizon and drawing a uh a dark blue i think it was a dark i think it was a blank uh curtain behind it that is if you stand and look where the sun is setting at the sky there and then turn around and look at what's it's left behind there's a big difference mm -hmm. and the idea was that the sun was pulling this curtain behind it as it's set all right i've all, one of my favorites is the uh uh, uh shredded salmon sky mm. 
uh, at a sunset. The word, yeah, the word shredded right there. And, and the, the color salmon, it's different. It's not just pink, it's salmon. And yeah. so that's different and unique. And guess what? It's also specific, right? It's a specific shade of pink. And so I think that's what's really, that's where you're earning your keep as a, as a writer there is with those, that fine choice of words. I, that's all I, I had. Mean, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I feel like I cut you off. <laughs> no, no, I was waiting for more. So, all right. So sound is the second one. Um, again, this is the most second most common. Um, and why is the site the most common one that people write about? It's because it's the easiest. We're a very visual uh, species. We like what we can see. Um, same thing with sound. These are the senses that we most rely on to navigate our world. And so it's what we most often describe, which is fine to a certain extent, because again, the reader is going to be able to interpret through the senses of sight and sound. However, the, the real drawback is that these become cliche very easily. And so it's hard to describe new sights and new sounds in unique and memorable ways. For every shredded salmon sky that we see, also I like the alliteration triple points there because there's three S's. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the sky was light blue. There's probably a hundred thousand of those. And that's just mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of boring. Um, and so you want to clean up the boring, get rid of the boring and, and keep the spectacular, keep the stuff that's really going to make, that's going to stick in the minds of your readers. So uh, how do you do sound again? Something specific, unique, and memorable. In the early evening, cicadas called to each other in their humming, buzzing language, interrupted only by the occasional car driving past on the country road a mile south. So we get a sense of where they are, um, we know cicadas are only in a particular part of the, you know, the country and they only come out at a particular time of year. And so that level of specificity, um, as well as the onomatopoeia, since we're describing sound, humming, buzzing language, um, kind of gives us a little bit more there. Does that make sense? What kind of onion? Onomata on, onion. On a, yeah. On, oh no. <laughs> end of tomato. Edgar Allan Poe. I A. What? That's how you spell uh, onomatopoeia. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so. Now, bonus. Here's the thing that I see a lot of new writers do. Uh, they want to write, it was silent or silence, period, um, or everything was quiet, period. How, it's really hard to appeal to the sense of sound by saying that there was no sound, right? It's about as exciting as saying everything was black. That's not super exciting. Now it feels like I'm sleeping. Am I sleeping? Is that what's going on? So instead, what you want to do is you want to find the quiet noises that become that announce themselves in those moments of silence, perhaps conversation, um, when there's a, a big reveal or something. So, for example, um, someone says, "I'm pregnant, Jim." The ceiling fan hummed overhead. On the wall clock, I'm sorry, on the wall, her Hello Kitty clock ticked and ticked and ticked. Somewhere, a dog barked. Say something, she said. So what you're doing with this is you're, you're getting, it's kind of a two for one. Number one, you're saying that it's silent without actually saying that it's silent. Number two, you're giving us that quiet moment. So the reader is experiencing that quiet moment. And just because we're having to read so many words, we understand that time is passing and that Jim has not said anything to uh, this other character's big reveal, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does. It's uh, you're letting the reader experience the wait when you do something like that. Hmm. And it's a great thing to do when you can. Uh, when you say I'm pregnant, Jim, and then quickly switch to the ceiling fan hummed overhead, that tells us that he hasn't spoken. Hmm. Then we hear another sound on the wall. Her Hello Kitty clock ticked and ticked and ticked. Okay. And then that raises a sense of frustration with that. Somewhere a dog barked. All this time he hasn't responded yet. Then she says, say something. And then that verifies our suspicion. And mm -hmm. we know there's a problem. It's a, it's a simple technique. I say it's simple. It's actually challenging when you have to sit there and think, what would they actually hear? Um, it's, but it is a fairly simple technique, but it's a really powerful one. Um, and it's a, it's a moment of, as Charles Baxter would say, it's a moment of stillness. 
um, and that can heighten the tension in moments like that. So um, let, me, let me add something else to that to, uh, to make sure that everyone's clear on this because uh, you've done something good here. You say the ceiling fan to, hummed overhead. You don't tell us what kind of ceiling fan it is because there's no need to. You don't tell us it's a five blade fan, you know, or that the, uh, the blades look like um, palm leaves. Hmm. You know, you don't tell us it was a Home Depot special uh, ceiling fan hummed overhead. It makes no sense. But in the next line, you do give us a detail. On the wall, her Hello Kitty clock ticked, and that brought in the visual aspect because we could see that. Then also makes me want to say this very quickly. Writers often struggle with the idea of using brand names and trademarked names in their writing, in their fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, it, can I go ahead and just say why that is? Yeah. Uh, because if, especially if you read writers' magazines, there'll be ads in there asking you say, um, you know, call it facial tissue, not Kleenex. Uh, there'll be ads like that because the way our laws are in the United States is it, you can lose your trademark if it becomes part of the national language. Okay. So oh. if you keep, if we keep calling all facial tissues Kleenex, Kleenex will lose its control of that word Kleenex. And so they have, they're required by law to defend it. Hmm. Uh, but the problem is when it gets into fiction, what are they going to do? In a sense, you're almost advertising for them. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I've seen people put little trademark symbols on there. Don't do that. Uh, in the past, I have on occasion, if I got worried about something, I'd put it at the end of the book. The following names are trademarked and just list them. Mm. But I don't even do that anymore. So if you read, uh, again, uh, say Stephen King, you, know, he, you don't drink a soda, you drink a Coke. Right. Okay. Or a Dr. Pepper, uh, if you're doing something like that. Or it's not just a beer. Sometimes you'll see a generic beer, but it's mm. a Coors. Uh, and most writers will do that. Now, th those people don't like you to do that because they're afraid they're going to lose their trademark. Uh, my argument is it's a dumb law. If it appears in fiction, it shouldn't count. Right. Uh, you know, because no one's trying to steal it. It's not being used in that sense. It's uh, a proper description because it probably was a uh, box of Kleenex. Yeah. And you're being uh, something else. You're, you're being specific, right? Right. Um, but I... I did that kind of instinctively, and I think the reason I didn't leave the brand name of the ceiling fan is, you're right, it, it's not important to the character, but the Hello Kitty clock is more important to the character. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I don't say what kind of dog barks because they wouldn't be able to know. Um, if I had established this dog lives next door and it's an annoying little chihuahua or something like that, I might say the annoying ch chihuahua barked next door or something like that. But for the most part, I just borrowed that from Kurt Vonnegut, the somewhere a dog barked it's from Slaughterhouse five. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's, it was just something to, to again, show, as you say, it pops the weight. I don't know if you meant the W A I T or the W E I G H T weight. Uh, it's a little bit of both. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Well, I think I was referring to the fact that she's having to wait. The yeah. character you introduce is having to wait. Therefore, the reader has to wait. Mm -hmm. But and in also, the process of doing that, you created an emotional wait. That's where I was going. Yeah. You got there before <laughs> I did. No, wait. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So moving on quickly. Uh, the next one, smell. This one is often overlooked, and which makes me sad. Uh, because it's really closely associated with memory. Our sense of smell is very closely associated with memory. For example, if I talk to you about the smell of rain, um, when you smell that, it, it brings you back to a particular time uh, when you first notice the smell, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, at least it does for me because I live in the desert, so I don't get to see it a lot. Um, or, uh, you know, some a particular smell of walking pet oh man when i at work we had my last job and there had some there was some sewage problems there and so you would walk past a particular part of campus and there were some pretty powerful smells there um and what happens is even though we don't often think uh to describe how something smells it's really really powerful and memorable uh, here's an example. The earthy, oily smell of wet pavement was replaced by a warm vanilla scent when she entered her grandmother's house. There are pretty, there are probably fewer descriptions that are going to be more powerful to establish a setting than smell. Um, 
you can immediately make a setting feel comfortable and inviting, like warm vanilla scent, or um, overwhelming, um, nauseating, terrifying, and those types of things, just by describing the sharp iron scent of blood or whatever else it might be. Um, those are really, really powerful types of descriptions. And the same is true for taste. We don't talk a lot about taste because it seems weird. Like, how do you, how does taste establish setting? Do they look the concrete? Um, no. <laughs> well, but, they did in New Orleans a few times. Not my characters. I'm just saying. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. Uh, but the, then if we go back to New York, uh, thinking of particular uh, foods that are common there, mm. like New York pizza is, you know, established as uh, a kind of a, a part of the city. Um, and Nola, there's, uh, what is it? Beignets and, uh, it's Cafe de Bon. Now everybody's going to log off and, and go get beignets. Not without me. Um, Take me with you. So those types of things. So try and think of, of, you know, the foods that they're going to eat, customary foods, cultural foods, um, and how those taste and, and what they're known for. Uh, something like, sure, it was only macaroni and cheese, but it was for grown-ups. The saltiness of the prosciutto complemented the creamy, sharp cheddar enveloping perfectly seasoned pasta. Dude, I don't know if you would... now I'm hungry. Yeah, I don't know if you want to go quite to that extent unless your character's a foodie, but uh, a, a little bit in there just to give us a taste of the description. Oh, oh man. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Touch. Uh, this one is often overlooked as well. Perhaps the least utilized form of establishing setting. Um, but again, very, very powerful. Thinking here specifically of textures. Uh, we like to talk about things that are smooth or rough, but that's usually about as far as we go. Don't forget hot and cold weather, the heat, the humidity. That's all uh, appealing to the sense of touch. Um, and so keeping that at the forefront is, is powerful, including fashion, including establishing fashion. Mm -hmm. The shirt was rough, like wearing burlap. He put the skin crawling itchiness of the fabric out of his mind. He only had to wear it for an hour and then he could take a cool shower and rinse the itch off his skin. So mm -hmm. uh, here we're getting a little bit of mileage out of the type of fabric and how it feels on the skin and why you know this is perhaps a customary shirt or maybe it's a uniform or something like that that's going to help establish the setting of our book uh we good together we that, does that all make sense it does kissing him was like kissing 80 grit sandpaper yeah i that just doesn't always have to be fingers yeah <laughs> that's true that is absolutely true um well said pops so we have 10 minutes uh, Molly, how much, how many questions do we have? We have a good amount of questions here. We have, let me see, one, two, three, four questions. Yeah. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go to questions. I've got a bunch of um, quotes that I absolutely love in terms of um, establishing setting and detail. They're really powerful. I could probably talk about each one for about six or seven minutes, but I'm not going to. They'll be on the show notes. So check out aaronganski.com tomorrow, um, probably tomorrow afternoon, and those will be up there. You'll notice I've attributed several of the quotes to B.A.J., which is just Brad Anthony Johnston. Most of his quotes there, I'll probably have to adjust the show notes to give proper credit here, but um, it's from a book that he edited called Naming the World. It's mm. one of my top craft books that, that I would recommend, um, and it comes from his chapter, Setting in Detail. So. Uh, I just highlighted almost the whole thing. Really, really quality stuff. If you want more good stuff from him, uh, I would look at that book, Naming the World by Brett Anthony Johnston. It's phenomenal. It's It will change you as a writer for the better. Um, I also have some writing prompt type exercises in case you want to develop uh, your skill at establishing settings. So I'll have those on the show notes for you as well. So Molly, Great. what kind of questions do we have? 
So the first comes from John M, who I am not seeing in the chat room anymore, but he was on in the beginning. Well, thanks for he, joining us, John. Yeah, he asked, when do we copyright our work? Is this before we submit to an mm -hmm. agent or publisher or once it's ready for publication? Now, Dave Fessenden jumped in and said, basically creative license, it's already copyright as soon as we start to create it, but he wants to register that copyright once he's ready for publication. But I told him I would ask the room or ask the host what you guys recommend. Pops, that's really, I think, a good question for you. Yeah, Dave's right. Uh, once you write it, it's already uh, protected by copyright laws. Uh, now, some people used to uh, take their work and mail it to themselves, tape the envelope shut, mail it to mm -hmm. themselves so it'll have a date on it and not open it uh, to be able to prove that the, the work is theirs. But you really don't have to do that. And if you get a publisher, they're going uh, to arrange for the copyright in your name. Be sure to check your contract on that before you sign it. That the copyright's going to be in your name. There's a few that have tried to take that right away. Very few. The uh, professional publishers know that the copyright uh, will be in your name. And it doesn't matter much to them because you're granting them the right to publish it anyway for... Well, until they either stop selling or they release it, put it out of print and return the rights to you, which is a whole other topic. But uh, so it, you really don't have to send in for copyright. I don't think I ever have. Uh, all my books that have been published, of uh, the formal copyright has been filed by the publisher. And I think if you're really concerned about it, um, I, I don't know that it's really a valid concern, but I think if you if you are really concerned about it, uh, try emailing a digital copy to yourself and then just keep it in your email. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of accomplishes the same thing as, as mailing it to yourself. Um, so I don't know. But again, I, I don't really think it's going to be that big of an issue. So I, I, I wonder if that question comes from a place of what if somebody steals the novel that I'm working on. I'm writing a novel. I'm afraid somebody's going to steal it. It doesn't really happen. Number one. Number two, I wouldn't share it with anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And I especially wouldn't share it with anybody I didn't trust. Um, right. So I, I've never, that's never been a concern for me because I've never been sharing my work or publishing my work, um, digitally publishing it. Of course, even then, if you digitally publish it, say on a blog and you want to do it like serial style, uh, just publishing it on a blog is going to be, it's going to, you know, basically be copyrighted from, from that. I, I believe in my pops that, well, technically, I, and I think, uh, uh, Dave could probably give a better answer uh, as an agent. But once you, once you write it, it is already, uh, under mm -hmm. copy protection. Mm -hmm. Um, if somebody wants to steal it, they have to prove that they wrote it. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Now, it, there's been right. a few cases like that with screenplays that I know of, where someone c claims that the idea for a screenplay was stolen. That's a little different ball game. But for uh, for books, for uh, magazine articles, and most people who have any common sense aren't going to steal uh, someone else's creative work mm -hmm. because it gets very expensive to defend that. Right. Fair enough. That makes sense. So I asked the room if they set their stories in real or fictional locations. And Sophia Hansen said hers is fictional and on a different planet. But she describes kelp and seaweed using those same words, kelp and seaweed. Does that work? She also said, I'm sorry, she also said she has alien words, but she tries to use them sparingly. I'm okay with it. Um, I mean, at some point you're writing for your, your audience, your audience knows what kelp and seaweed are. Um, I don't think any r reader is going to go, well, that's, they wouldn't call it kelp. Um, I think it's a good shortcut. Uh, if you want to be super crazy, you could call, you know, the blue kelp, if you want to make it like different or stand out, or if you want to make it uh, even more specific, the Tresconian kelp, blah, blah, blah. And so you can go a long way with world building by again, throwing in some specific types of um, things that are just a little bit different. For example, in the hand of Adonai series, I've got the cerulean forest <coughs> in which, or the cerulean woods, I'm sorry, in which um, the harspice wood, there are harspice trees and the harspice trees have blue leaves. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it's a tree 
it's got black bark and it's got blue leaves. So there you go. But it also has different, uh, in, in my fictional world, it also has like pine trees and next to some of the fictional trees. So it's, I think you're okay with it. Yeah, I was a little divided on it. Uh, cause my first thought is, yeah, those are pretty specific English words. Um, and I could imagine a reader saying, I, would they really use that? Or is that breaking the fictive dream? But when you really get down to it, you're writing a whole book in English anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So you want to give a hint that some of these things are really not of this planet. You want to maintain that part of the fictive dream. Um, so if you feel like the word kelp is going to uh, break that fictive dream, smash it, then I would uh, put on my imagination hat and come up with a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Maybe by, you know, description. Uh, and then, you know, or that was used as a, uh, for food, you know, which we use kelp for all the time, among other things. And uh, you, you could probably do that, but that is always a tough thing in fantasy. Um, you know, so, so if you're in Middle Earth here, we're going to go back to something Aaron said earlier. Um, what are the weapons they carry? Do they have shields? Mm -hmm. Do they call their shields something else? Do they have swords? Do they call their swords something else? Um, you know, they, they talk about their feet. You know, so there comes a point where it, it just gets ridiculous uh, with that. So I would say probably you're okay with it. Um, but if you could be a little more creative, uh, you can do a nice little show instead of uh, telling uh, about it. Uh, it might even be better. All right. I agree. I told her that I think as, as a reader, we need something we can identify with to spring from. So if we can have some kind of form of what's our reality, and then what you were saying, Al, then, and, and Aaron, then develop it into something different. But we need that commonality, that identity up front in order to know exactly what it is. Otherwise, she's going to spend page after page of describing something that we have no idea what it is or what it's like. Yeah. You have to be creative um, with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caleb Walton is in the room, and he says both of his works in prod, I, his WIPs, why am I not thinking work in works progress? In progress yeah. <laughs> both of his work in progresses are set in generic settings, and he's having a hard time deciding on a setting. What are some suggestions on how to decide, and how much should he expect to have to alter it, af alter the plot as a result? I'm sorry, I was typing something in the room. I missed the first part. I noticed that. that. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so, so sorry. So, that's really, so Aaron, really Aaron is, yeah. Okay. He's, he's writing two separate stories, and they're generic. He, they, he doesn't have them in a particular setting. He's having a hard time deciding on the setting. So what are some suggestions on how to decide, and how much should he expect to have to alter the setting or alter the plot as a result of becoming more specific with his setting? Okay, the plot will dictate the setting. Yes. Okay, so if, if there's going to be a bank robbery, there's going to be a bank. If there's going to mm -hmm. be a train robbery, there's going to be a train. So the setting is going to be set on a train or a bank or whatever it is that you're doing there. So it, it's hard for me to conceive of, of having a story with some action but no setting. Usually you have the setting first. Um, I mean, you know something's going to happen, but then you put it in a setting, then you let the action uh take off from there because that setting may change some of the action and then you'll be in, in your second or third draft and, and having to make big changes with it. So uh, every scene has a setting. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it has to. And so what I would say, Caleb, is you already know what you want your setting to be, whether it's a fantasy world or a science fiction world or small town America or big city America. Um, you have whatever generic setting you have in mind you've probably been writing with that in mind. So I would say the next step is to just drill down on some more specifics. Do you want it to be fictional or real? What one better serves the story? Um, if you wanna make it fictional, but base it on a real town, okay, that's fine too. Look at some maps, change some names, um, whatever whatever you need to do. Um, how much is your, your manuscript gonna change? Um, it, that really depends on how much time and effort you put into establishing the setting. But um, usually I would say that, especially if you're writing genre like science fiction or fantasy, there's a lot of world building up front. And so you would probably 
be able to count on a pretty solid rewrite of your opening chapters, but um, subsequent chapters may not be as um, as heavily altered, if that makes sense. Um, I hope that answers this question. Yeah, and it, uh, I try to inject myself uh, more and more later in my career, I began to do this, where I would stand with my characters in my mind. Our imagination is our tool. That is the thing we most have. It's our superpower. It's our cape. Um, and I'll stand with my characters and say, now, what do I see? I want to know where I am and what it is I see. Then that's what I use to set up my setting. Then my characters know how to act. Mm -hmm. I may know what the, the crucial thing to happen in that scene, but since I have the scene now, the setting, um, then they can act in front of that backdrop. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. I think we're good with that one. One more, you said, Molly? Yes, uno momento, because now I'm typing something in the chat room. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I can't All believe right. you. We're cool. So Yolanda Smith, lovely, lovely woman. I spent some great one-on-one -on -one time with her at Blue Ridge this year, and she's just really amazing. She said she's a little worried about this time period aspect of setting. Her work in progress is set in Appalachia, specifically the backwoods of Kentucky. Life didn't change much over a 50 year period and she's really struggled to know when to place her story. She said, I plan to be vague sometime between 1830s and 1870s, but avoiding civil wars. Thus far, I've not needed to be specific, but I'm wondering if this will hurt my story in the long run. Thoughts? I think you wanna, I think you wanna drill down a little bit more specifically. If, if we're talking about the civil war, uh, you can't ignore that. So you'll either need to um, set it before the Civil War, and maybe there are some tensions brewing. Um, you could do it after, but that would probably drastically alter what you're doing. Um, during, same thing. Um, if if it's in, you said Appalachia. I'm not. I don't know much about that. I would recommend. Um, I don't know if you've read Cindy Sproul's works. Uh, Liar's Winter and uh, Mercy's Reign was the first one, and then Liar's mm -hmm. Winter. Um, which are, I believe, set in the same basic area. Maybe not Kentucky, maybe Tennessee, um, but Appalachian Mountains. So I, I don't. I think hers are like early 1900s, though. I think it's it's um, well after the Civil War. But those might be good to read. Um, I don't know, pops. What do you think? Yeah, I think you need to have a time in mind because there's, sooner or later, there's going to be a social reference of some sort even though you're dealing with an isolated community uh, that did not change much. Uh, but if you're in the, like in the, um, well, the time period that she gave us it wouldn't apply. But if you were talking about um, that community during the time of prohibition is very different than yeah. um, the time mm -hmm. say before prohibition. Uh, so you need to, you know, to, yeah, you need to put down a couple of tent pegs someplace. Um, I would uh, just mention here, so I'm looking at the chat room, Dave mm -hmm. saying that I drew on my experience as a punk, punk rocker in Hearts song. Um, wasn't a punk rocker, uh, I was a little bit more of a metalhead, but let's not get into how much makeup I wore on stage. Um, oh, that's boy. A different, it's a different <laughs> podcast altogether. Um, but Big, Becky had mentioned something about uh, Hearts song, and just on the topic of setting, um, there are uh, two fictional towns that play a pretty significant role in um in fictional towns in california in hearts song but they also visit very real cities um most of it is set in los angeles um and but there are times where they're in seattle and so looking that kind of stuff up researching that um you know they're in san diego for a time uh, las vegas for a time so those types of things we intermixed fictional and non-fictional um, settings. And we just mm -hmm. did our research when it was non-fictional um, and we used our imaginations when it was fictional. Um, but we still had to figure out, okay, where in California would these fictional towns be? Because if they're driving from one place to another, we got to make sure that the, the, you know, the time, the driving time is going to be somewhat accurate, but there's that. Um, yeah. So that good. Any mm -hmm. other questions, Molly? 
No more questions. That is the end of it. Um, but just a little note, they were referencing Heart Song because the comment right above that, I put the link to your Facebook page. We're focusing this month on Heart Songs. We're asking and interviewing both authors and posting questions from the chat room and whoever else wants to participate. So go to Erin's Facebook page. The link is in the chat room here and in the newsletter as well. And you can leave your comments and we'll be having polls and little quizzes set up and question and answer throughout the rest of the month. Maybe not pop quizzes. This is not gonna be like school, but just, you know, like fun, fun quizzes, po po not quizzes, po polls. Polls, polls, surveys, not quizzes. Not survey. Surveys seem to like take a survey, win a prize. No, there polls. is yeah. no wrong answer. All right, interactive, interactive stuff. So there you go. Yeah. Well, uh, that is about what all we have for this week. Pops, anything else before we sign off? Nope. I think I said everything I can say. All right. Well, again, uh, don't forget to check out the show notes tomorrow for those fantabulous quotes and uh, the setting exercises. Those will be there. If you're looking for us throughout the week, you can find me at AaronGansky.com. You can find Pops at AltonGansky.com. And you can find Molly at franklymydearmojo.com. Mm -hmm. So as always, we thank you for listening. And until next time, good writing.